Hello, everyone. So here I'm back with uh, the third part of the human reproductive system, wherein we'll be mainly focusing on the structure of the gametes, uh, as well as on the process of fertilization and certain parts of the uh, embryonic membranes as well. Now, uh, as far as the male gamete is concerned, that is the sperm or the spermatozoan, as it is also called. So it has three main parts. So let us just have a look at the three main parts of the human sperm and also the structures that are contained within it. So here is the head of the sperm. Then you have the middle piece and then you have the tail. So the head, middle piece and the tail are the three main parts of the human sperm. At the junction of the head and the middle piece is a narrow constricted region that is called as the neck. Now, if we see what is contained within the head, then the most of the space within the head is, cover, is uh, covered up by the nucleus. So this is the nucleus here on your screen, which contains the genetic material, which is either 22X or 22 and Y. So it has 22 autosomes and either X or a Y chromosome. Then this structure that covers or fits like a cap above the nucleus, is called as the acrosome, which is a derivative of the Golgi body. In grade nine, you have studied in the chapter cell that the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus gives rise to the acrosome of the sperm. Now this acrosome of the sperm is very important because it produces or releases an enzyme called hyaluronidase that helps the sperm to penetrate through the corona radiata, that is the outermost cellular covering of the ovum. The ovum has two coverings, the outer cellular covering called corona radiata, whose cells are glued together or held together with the help of hyaluronic acid. So to dissolve that acid and to separate the cells to make a way or a passage for the sperm to further move in, the acrosome releases the enzyme hyaluronidase. Now, the second covering of the ovum inner to the corona radiata is the zona pellucida. So there will be zona lysin also that will be released to help the sperm to penetrate the egg further. So the head has two important structures coming back, the nucleus and the acrosome. So nucleus contains all the male genetic material and the acrosome produces or releases the enzyme called as hyaluronidase. Now coming to the middle piece, so in the middle piece, you can see these are spirally coiled structures around the axial filament. Now these spirally coiled structures are actually the mitochondria. I repeat, these are actually the mitochondria. So you can see I've just zoomed in, so you can clearly see the structure of the mitochondria. Now these mitochondria are responsible for generating the energy that is required for the movement of the sperm. Now, The next part is the tail, which contains the axial filament. And the tail is responsible for generating the lashing movement or the whip-like movement, which helps in the propulsion of the sperm. So these are the three main parts of the sperm and the function of the associated structures. Now let us shift our focus to the structure of the ovum very quickly. We'll just the ovum is also called as a secondary oocyte. I repeat, the ovum is also called as the secondary oocyte. Now, as far as the ovum is concerned, it is the largest cell. I repeat, it is the largest cell in the human body. Now, uh, coming to the structure of the ovum. You can see here, it is somewhat a spherical structure. Now, 
we will just get into the model of the ovum in detail as well here. Now, the, there are two coverings around the ovum. The outermost covering is a cellular covering that is called as the corona radiata. I repeat, the outermost covering is called as the corona radiata. And the inner layer is called as the zona pellucida. So I'll just show you all the structures, the layers, corona radiata here. You can see this. And then you have the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is non-cellular while corona radiata is cellular in nature. So once we hide them one by one, we can now see the membrane of the ovum that is called as the vitelline membrane as well. Now, now within the ovum, you can see the cytoplasm and you can see a nucleus as well. Now, so that's the nucleus. So the nucleus will contain 23 chromosomes, which is 22 autosomes and X chromosome. There'll be no Y chromosome because females do not have a Y chromosome. So the female gamete only has 22 autosomes along with the X chromosome. Now, so that is about the structure of the ovum. Now, coming on to the event of fertilization. So as far as fertilization is concerned, it is the process of union of the male and the female gametes, okay, resulting in the formation of a zygote. So the male and the female gamete unite or fuse together to form a structure that is called as the zygote. So zygote is the first cell of new life, basically. Now, as far as fertilization is concerned, once the sperm makes contact with the vitelline membrane, vitelline membrane, remember, is the egg membrane. So the first sperm to make contact with the vitelline membrane will go on to successfully fertilize the egg while the remaining sperms okay, may get trapped because as soon as the first sperm makes contact with the vitelline membrane, the zona pellucida will harden and prevent or trap any sperms which may be in its vicinity. So it will prevent any other sperm from further entering in or trap other sperms that may be there in the vicinity. So zona pellucida will very quickly change into a fertilization membrane preventing any more sperms from entering the egg. So under no conditions or under no situation will there be a case of polyspermy in humans. So only a single sperm fertilizes the egg. So as you can see in this diagram here, that the male pronucleus and the female pronucleus are about to fuse together and complete the process of fertilization. So as soon as fertilization is completed, the zygote starts dividing by the process called as cleavage or segmentation resulting in the formation of a two-celled embryo, four-celled stage, 16-cell stage, which is also called as the modula, even the 32-cell stage called as the blastosis. So usually the embryo reaches the uterus okay, by passing down the fallopian tubes okay, uh, around day number five or day seven after ovulation, that is on day number 21 or 22 of the menstrual cycle. So once it reaches the uterus, the zona pellucida will be shed and the blastocyst will implant or fix itself in the walls of the endometrium. So this event by which the blastocyst fixes itself in the wall of the endometrium is called as implantation. Once implantation is over, the blastocyst will start absorbing nourishment or nutrients from the endometrial blood vessels and it will start proliferating very rapidly. By the time it is five weeks, the embryo is highly advanced. The circulatory system and the nervous system are quite well developed. By the time it is week eight of gestation, the webbing between the fingers and the toes disappear. The gill slits will disappear. The tail, embryonic tail disappears. And the embryo starts appearing like a human. So this is at this time, that is about seven or eight week of gestation, we start using the term fetus. So embryo is only in the early stages, that is about the first seven to eight weeks, and then we call it as the fetus until birth. Now, the fetus is surrounded by a couple of membranes. The first membrane to surround the fetus is the amnion. Now, as far as the amnion is concerned, 
it secretes a fluid that is called as the amniotic fluid now this amniotic fluid has protective functions it protects the embryo from any kind of jerks or any mechanical shocks like for example if the mother happens to accidentally trip over so it will try to protect the embryo, uh, fetus from any kind of mechanical jerks or shocks secondly the amnion the amniotic fluid also allows certain restricted movements to the fetus thirdly it prevents the fetus from sticking to the walls of the embryo i repeat it prevents the fetus from sticking to the walls of the embryo so these are the roles of the amniotic fluid so it protects the fetus from any kind of jerks or shocks secondly it pro prevent, uh, provides a scope of some restricted movement to the fetus thirdly it pre prevents the fetus from sticking to the amnion and last but not the least it maintains an even pressure on the fetus from all the sides now the placenta placenta is a temporary endocrine tissue that is formed by the contribution of two organisms one is the fetus and other is the mother so the maternal part that contributes to the formation of the placenta are the uterine villi and the fetal part that contributes to the formation of the placenta are the chorionic villi so these two set of villi that is the maternal villi or the uterine villi and the chorionic villi sort of interlock and form this disc shape temporary endocrine tissue called as the placenta the placenta is endocrine in nature and it produces hormones estrogens and progesterone apart from its endocrine function placenta also has a crucial role in ensuring the supply of nourishment oxygen to the fetus and also carries away the metabolic waste and carbon dioxide from the fetus and therefore it is called as the lifeline of the baby because it provides nutrients and oxygen to the baby and also carries away metabolic waste and carbon dioxide fetus is kind of a barrier between the mother and the fetus uh, sorry uh, the placenta is a kind of a barrier between the fetus and the mother so why do i call it as the barrier is because it tries to prevent direct contact of blood between the mother and the fetus if the maternal blood vessels directly open into the fetal blood vessels then the high pressure of the maternal blood may damage the soft and delicate tissues of the fetus secondly if the maternal and the fetal blood groups do not match that can result in an immunological reaction thirdly if the mother is carrying certain infection it may directly pass on to the fetus via blood and therefore direct exchange of maternal and fetal blood does not take place instead only the nutrients gases and metabolic waste will diffuse through the placenta either from the fetus to the mother or vice versa so all the nutrients and oxygen from the maternal blood diffuses into the fetal blood vessels at the placenta while the metabolic waste and carbon dioxide from the fetal blood will diffuse into the maternal blood at the placenta so the villi that interlock contain the blood vessels of both mother and the fetus but they do not open into each other directly however although the placenta blocks the passage of most pathogens there are certain viruses such as that of the hiv that can cross through the placenta and reach the fetus now uh the connection that brings our health in the exchange of the fetal and the maternal contents of blood that is the nutrients the gases and the waste materials is the umbilical cord so umbilical cord is basically the connection of the fetus to the placenta now as far as uh the development is concerned the entire period or the full term development of the fetus is called as gestation which lasts for about 280 days or roughly about 40 weeks or a little over 9 months in humans so the normal gestational period is about 280 days or 40 weeks a little over 9 months which is at the end of the gestation the expulsion of a fully mature fetus from the uterus is called as parturition it is called as parturition so at the time of parturition the amnion bursts the amniotic fluid is released which kind of lubricates the passage or the birth canal and the head is the first part of the baby 
okay, to be expelled out, followed by the rest of the body. Now, after the expulsion of the fetus, even the placenta detaches and is expelled out. Once the birth is completed, the umbilical cord is clipped at two ends and then it is cut in between the two clippings. Okay, so it is ligated and it is cut and the placenta will be removed as after birth. The uterus returns back to its normal condition or to its normal state in a couple of days or a week's time. Now, coming to the last part of the topic, which just introduces the concept of twins. Now, there are two kinds of twins. One that is identical or the maternal twins, which are basically formed from a single fertilized egg, which may get, which may get split and separated into two parts during its early stages of cell division. So when a single fertilized egg splits and separates into two parts during the early stages of development may result in identical twins, also called as maternal twins. They share the same kind of genetic material and obviously they will be of the same sex. But some, in some cases, both the ovaries may simultaneously release an egg in the menstrual in the in the particular menstrual cycle and normally in each menstrual cycle only one ovary produces the egg and it keeps on alternating so if in a particular month it's a left ovary the next next month it will be the right ovary that will release the egg or the ovum but sometimes both the ovaries may simultaneously release an egg and both of the, them may get fertilized so in such cases you will have two fertilized eggs that will be received by the uterus uh, for, and the fertilization has been achieved by two separate sperms, and that is why the genetic material uh, of such fetuses would be different. They will be non-identical twins, also known as fraternal twins, and they may or may not be of the same sex. But remember that identical twins are always of the same sex, whereas non-identical twins may or may not be of the same sex. So that's it about the... Um, uh, human reproductive system and the process of fertilization and some introduction to the post-fertilization structures, uh, events, and the process of parturition. So I hope the concepts have been clear. Thank you for uh, watching the videos. Please uh, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.